It's the second weekend of deer camp, second and final weekend. It's like 6.30 right now, so I don't have a deer tag, but today I'm just gonna tag along with one of my uncles and my nephew. My nephew, he's the youngest one here and he's looking for his first deer, so I'm gonna see what I can do and try to help him out. So that's it, we got a late start, so we're gonna start hiking as the sun starts rising and we'll just see if we can find my nephew Elliot a mule deer. been just hiking through all this timber right here haven't seen or bumped anything so we're just gonna keep trekking up that way see if we can go see at least one deer today's perfect weather overcast rain last night so all the ground is super soft so when you're walking there's no crunch just stealth timber stalking which is good so air's crisp you're not overheating it's just good conditions to be hiking around with a rifle in hand after mule deer There's a lot, Let's see if there's a buck. You see six of them? Really? I only see four. I see the four in the opening. Oh, there's more. Okay, we'll see. Oh, dang, that's a lot of deer. Oh, there's a spike. There's a spike. Spike moved down. Probably gonna go back down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's another one. Oh, I see him. Dude, there's a lot of deer. Oh, there's one more in the tree. Oh, there it is. That was a doe. Well, it took us like half a day to just finally see our first deer of the trip, but it's like 10 does and a spike. And they were just running around out in this little opening next to some timber, but no legal bucks. So I think we're just gonna keep moving on. He's in the bush. Right there. A lot of these resident does that live basically in this area, you know, they go through so many seasons of just seeing hunters and 
they just know that hunters are no threat to them because you're not allowed to shoot does, at least during the rifle season. And, you know, they just kind of lose that fear of people because they know that we don't harm them. And so sometimes you come across a seasoned doe like that, you can walk right up to that doe and she doesn't really care about you. She'll just keep feeding. So that's one of the things. Now, bucks, on the other hand, that's a completely different story. But nonetheless, those encounters with those does, they're always cool because it's just neat to be able to get up close and personal with some of those deer. But we haven't found a buck yet. Wind's picking up and deer are starting to move. So I'm going to put the glass to work and see if we can spot something moving out. Last light. decided to stop glassing because the wind chill was pretty gnarly so we're just back to timber stalking and just walking along this old road just literally walked up on three does I think there's just three does but the deer are up and moving so it's a pretty good time to timber stalk honestly because when these deer are bedded, it's really hard to timber stalk because when they're bedded, they're low on the ground, it's hard to see them. So you could literally just walk right by them. But now that these deer are up and feeding, it's just a lot more easy to pick them apart in the timber.
He's all the way down there. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Shoot it. No, take your time. Okay, no, no, not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Not yet, not yet. Okay. Okay. Take your time. Shoot it. Oh, you got it. Yeah, you can, you can help us. Okay. Oh my gosh, dude. I told you you were going to shoot one today. Yeah. Last light, we came over to this spot. We just randomly walked down here. And my uncle spots a doe. And we get set up and I told Elliot, just chamber your gun you just in case. And then my uncle decides he's going to go up the ridge just to go see if there's any deer. And then the Elliot's like, oh, there's a buck. And he fed around this tree the whole time and he finally came back up. Five by five? Really? Yeah. You shot a big buck, did he? Four, four by four, four by five? He's a good buck. I thought it was a three by three. No, he's a big buck. <laughs> It's 5.43, it's probably been about 30 minutes, maybe, since Elliot shot, but Elliot shot, the bug dropped. We all thought it was a perfect shot, just by the way he dropped. And the camera gets bumped around because the tripod legs, like, I, I don't know, I think I might have pushed it or Elliot might have kicked it. But the one glimpse I have was I had the deer still kicking after it dropped. And then when we got over there, we couldn't find blood, we couldn't find anything. So I finally get back up, I look at the camera, I replay the footage in super, super slow motion. And Elliot actually like hit right on top of the neck. So we're just gonna back out of here and go back to camp and hopefully we can come back tomorrow and recover this deer. Jeez. It was my fault too. Instead of like staying on the deer to see what the deer was doing, like I just immediately celebrated, so. That's hunting, it happens. So, we'll see what happens tomorrow. It's the following morning and we snuck 
So, I made it home from deer camp and as per usual, the first thing I do when I get home is I dump my footage onto my computer and do a rough overview. On this particular trip back home, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time uh, reviewing my footage because you guys clearly watched what happened. And as much as it pains me to say this, I don't think that deer uh, is dead. I don't think the shot was a lethal hit. We spent pretty much the whole day, um, the day after Elliot shot, just trying to find that deer. We just couldn't find the deer. We couldn't find no, um, no blood. Uh, we found the hair where that deer slid when Elliot initially shot him, but that was it. Um, no blood, and then we just found a bunch of tracks of the deer running for maybe about 300 yards, and then we just couldn't find them anymore because the tracks eventually went into uh, a crossing point where there was just way too many tracks, and we just didn't know which track was his. So as much as it pains me to say that, that's just what happened on this trip. So I have the footage pulled up and this is actually a 18 minute clip, all right? So um, we watched that deer for quite a bit of time, but I'm just gonna skip over to basically about when the deer uh, popped out. So this is when me and Ellie are just waiting for this buck to pop out and right about here. Okay, so this is the buck. So you guys look at this, that is a beautiful buck. So it looks like he's three on the right side, he's three on the left side, and he has two nice little eye guards. So this buck is clearly legal. This look right here is when I first lay, eye on, lay eyes on the buck because I was uh, looking at my uncle who was coming down from the ridge. And so I was communicating to my uncle, but hey, uh, come down slowly because we have a buck down here. And so Elliot is still looking where the, the deer is. And so my eyes are off of where the deer are coming out. And literally as soon as I turn away, this buck walks out and that's when Elliot's like, Oh my goodness, there's the buck. And so I turn around and I look at him and this is my glimpse at him. And immediately in my binocular, I can see all his tines just sticking out. And I'm like, Elliot, this buck's legal, shoot it. So this is my first glance at him. And so he turns away cause he doesn't really care. And he might even, it looks like he has some stickers on his, uh, it looks like he has some stickers on his uh, G1. Yeah, he, he clearly has some stickers right here. But this is when Elliot is about to shoot. So as soon as he goes up, yeah, he he drops him. I don't know about you guys, but my first reaction when that deer dropped was that's a dead deer. Literally, I said that's a dead deer. And so we're just going to play this back. And okay, so I think um, I'm, I'm no, I'm doing this right. I'm gonna try to pause it right where the bullet flies. Okay, so I think Elliot hits him like right here. Like right where my arrow tip is pointing. I think that that is where Elliot hit. And in my binocular, if you look closely, you will actually see the entire shockwave because dude, we're talking about a 308, a 150 grain bullet at 133 yards. That bullet has a punch to it. And so when the bullet impacts the deer, I just see this entire part of the deer ripple. Like I literally see all the vibration. And so when I see that vibration through my binocular, I swear like Elliot like smacked him right in the kill zone. But that was just because the bullet had so much energy that when the bullet hit the deer, like it just sent an entire shock wave all around where it impacted the deer. And so I think Elliot hit him right up here, but I originally thought Elliot just smacked him right here in the kill zone. So as soon as he puts it, puts his head up. Okay, so this right here, you guys can see that is the bullet. That is the bullet in flight and see, you guys see that right here. You can see all of this. I don't know. I don't know if that's hair or if that's dust or anything, but it hits clearly high, like right above his neck essentially like super forward super high on the shoulder neck ish area and the deer just drops and so he drops and if you look he's just kicking so he like are you kidding me out of all my years of hunting when a deer drops like that 99.9% .9 of the time that is a dead deer okay and we're talking about Elliot 
10 years old, full of adrenaline. I'm anxious too to see what's going to happen as soon as Elliot shoots. And that's what happens. So when the deer just drops like a rock, like in my head, I'm just like, that's a dead deer. That's why I immediately celebrate it. So the camera gets kicked around and you can see right here, this white rump, that's the deer. And he's still just kicking there. And so I want to just go back to the shot because man, it just pains me to see this, but it's a nice bug. As soon as he lifts his head, this is when Elliot shoots. Okay, you can see the bullet, this little thing right here, that's the bullet right here and just impact. Boom. You see this little piece of hair that gets uh, dislocated right here? I think that's this general area right here is where Elliot hit. So he didn't hit him in the vitals because the lungs are right around here. Okay, so I think Elliot hit in that no man's land as what some people will call where it's like right above the neck and it's just, it's just muscle. There's no vital organs there. There's no um, main artery there, at least as far as I'm concerned, but he hits just essentially muscle here and the deer just drops because I mean, that, that bull is packing a punch. He drops, we're celebrating and my mistake is instead of staying on the deer after I shoot or after Elliot shoots, we just start celebrating. And as we're celebrating, this is when the deer eventually gets up. He gets up somewhere down here, uh, according to the tracks. And so he slides a little bit of ways down here and he eventually gets up and he just starts running. We never knew he ran because again, we just thought he died. So, you know, as hunters, if you're a hunter, Something like this is literally our worst nightmare. We don't go out there to hunt to simply wound animals. Every hunter out there is trying to put the best and ethical shot on an animal that they can. But if you've hunted long enough, things happen, right? We try our best, but sometimes this is just the way it goes sometimes. You, you make a not so perfect shot and the deer you wound the deer and you can't recover the deer. And sometimes you can't recover the deer and the deer just goes and dies somewhere else. Sometimes you can't recover the deer and the deer survives. In this particular case, I don't know if he's gonna survive, but I'm betting on the idea that he will survive because where he hit him, as far as I can tell, it's not a lethal shot. There's no, like, there's no vital organs there. I, as far as I can tell, it's just muscle that the, where the bullet hit. And so I think this deer will survive this gunshot you know as a mentor i thought i did my best to put elliot in the best position to succeed looking back at how it went down i clearly didn't do my job as a mentor what i should have done was i should have put elliot in a position where he was sitting down to shoot the deer if you guys watch the footage elliot wasn't sitting down he had his tripod and his gun was on the tripod but we had all the time in the world to put Elliot in a sitting position and we didn't do it. We put him, we left him standing up on the tripod. And so when that deer came out, literally the first thing I, I heard from Elliot after I told Elliot to shoot was I just heard him breathing. Like he was so excited. I could literally see him shaking. That's why in the footage, you guys hear me say over and over, I told Elliot, take your time, take your time, take your time. Because I knew who he was way too excited. And so I was trying my best to calm him down, but you know, that's, Dude, we're talking about again a 10 year old kid on his first deer hunt and there is a very very nice washington public land mule deer buck standing 130 yards away from him that was my first mistake the second mistake on my part was i forgot to check elliot's uh scope so he was on minimum power he was on four power and for a lot of experienced hunters a four power at 130 yards is plenty for what you need but when you're talking about a newer shooter and a youth shooter Four power is very, very small on a deer. So I completely like disregarded what magnification Elliot's scope was on. And that was my second mistake. I should have put him on at least like a seven or eight times zoom so that Elliot could see clearly where his crosshairs was on the deer. Because after he shot and he a I asked him where uh, the crosshairs were, was on the deer, he's like, I don't really know. I just kind of put it in the general area. and. The moment I heard that, like, dude, immediate regret. I don't know. I, I, I just should have remembered that, and I didn't. So those are my two biggest mistakes 
of getting Elliot his deer. If I would have gone back and I put Elliot in a sitting situation and zoomed his scope in, I have a feeling that we would have had a much more successful outcome than uh, what we had here. Even when the outcome is a little bit sour, like this is just hunting and this is just how it goes sometimes. If you've hunted long enough, you know exactly what we went through on this hunt. That's also one of the reasons why I like to film because when you film and things happen like this, you at least have some closure because if I didn't film this and we just had what we saw through our eyes and I just went off of what I saw when the deer dropped in my binoculars, I would have been so confused as to what happened because when I looked through the deer in the binoculars, I was like, that's a 100% dead deer. But now that we have the footage of Elliot's shot, we have closure because we can have a much better understanding of where the bullet actually hit, where and what actually happened. Nonetheless, it's a very, very bitter, sweet feeling. It's bitter that we didn't get the deer, the deer's out there wounded, and it happened on Elliot's first deer hunt. It's sweet that we have some closure on uh, what happened and we can learn from it and better ourselves in the future. But anyway, uh, Steve and I, we're gonna head out tomorrow in the morning and we're gonna try and go and fill Steve's deer tag. So I guess with that being said, I will just see you guys tomorrow when Steve and I, we go out and try to fill Steve's tag. I just had a dawn of fawn come out of this draw across from me. They hiked up onto this flat and then they just started running. They probably ran about a thousand yards in maybe like a minute or two. And Steve over here is just fast asleep. I would have woke him up, but he said to only wake him up when I spot a six by seven, so those are just those, not a six by seven. Kind of makes me curious as to why that doe and that fawn were on such a mission. At first, I thought they were being chased by coyotes, but I guess they just had a spot they really wanted to get to. I still see them right now. I just had a donut fawn like jump out of this draw. They got up to that flat and they like just ran all the way across. In the middle here? No, they were down there. They jumped up onto that flat. Uh, oh, okay. And then I saw the, I literally watched them run all the way across and they disappeared where I, those last huh. five deer disappeared into. Did they start in that corner in the bottom over there? Yeah, well when I saw them, I just saw them like basically already, they were already working their way up on those rocks. I wonder if they're going to fly across. They look like they're going to fly. Kind of neato. You just saw them coming up or something? Yeah, I just saw them. Just out of nowhere? Yeah. I was calling at you and then you're like, Steve. And I was like, so on. I couldn't hear you. Oh. I called your name twice. Not oh, really? I said Steve. The wind must carry right now. No oh, problem. Folks, we literally... We're just sitting here after I spotted that doe and that fawn running across. And Steve spots a turkey, a group of turkeys, a flock of turkeys working their way up from the bottom. I think we kind of spooked them because we were wearing orange. We're not that camouflaged. They walk up literally to the bottom of this rock face, literally a cliff. And I'm like, what the heck are these turkeys doing? Like, what do you think, what do you, they think they're doing? And they show me exactly what they're doing. They're basically rock climbers at this point that I didn't even know. So they basically 
fly up and now instead of being at the bottom of the valley they're now on top of the splat that was probably the coolest thing i've ever seen a turkey do that was super neat to see that's not something you see every day let alone on the internet i didn't know that turkeys were willing to do that but whoever said turkeys can't fly i got news for you buddy yeah, that's pretty neat. I've never seen such a thing before. <laughs> yeah, that kind of made our trip. Yeah. I mean, we're looking for deer, but man, whenever you see wildlife, especially doing something that you don't normally hear or see them do, that's just, really something else. I just think it's amazing if you just take a little bit of time to observe Mother Nature what you'll see. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're literally just sitting here. We're sitting behind this cliff because the wind's pretty bad, so the wind's blowing up and over us and we're literally just letting wildlife run in front of us and we've seen about seven deer couldn't identify that first herd of deer but then we have a bunch of turkeys here and legally Steve has a tag and he could shoot one of these turkeys but he didn't bring a shotgun we're not really turkey hunting though. <laughs> that's right we're deer hunting but sun is setting hopefully the deer start getting more active and we're gonna put the glass to use here. Do you guys hear that? There's no wind. The wind finally subsided after we stopped glassing. But we were glassing way across. Didn't see anything so we just decided to start heading back to the truck. But this was a brand new spot for me. Never hunted it so the fact that we even saw wildlife, that was a wind in my book. But we're just gonna work our way back to the truck, cook up a good dinner, and then go to bed and hunt again in the morning. I am starving after hiking, and we are gonna cook some backstrap and some bell lard that Nathaniel gave us from his beard this spring, this fall. And. It's gonna be delicious, I think. Do you smell that? Mm-hmm. Nothing like the smell of bear fat. Dude, it's delicious. Some deer meat from the meal deer I shot basically last week. This bag right here, this is a back strap, and then this right here. Uh it's either I think it's the round off the hind quarter. And then we got a lot of bear fat. Um, Nate's bear he shot back in August and you guys already know that seasoning over there <laughs> Alpine touch seasoning don't go nowhere without it man a lot of meat but I think we might be cooking these one at a time cool. that's fine now right yeah. let's do them one at a time so some people that ask me like what do you do with bear fat this is literally it you render down the bear fat and then it turns into oil and then you just use it like olive oil, vegetable oil, any type of cooking oil, honestly. But the thing with fall bear fat is their fat has a very sweet smell and sweet taste to their fat. It's not just like plain old vegetable oil. If you shoot a bear that's been grubbing on berries, their bear fat literally has a hint of whatever berries they've been eating. Yep. And Nate's bear, he, he was grubbing on huckleberries and just being downwind of where Steve is cooking smells very sweet. So that's the usefulness of bear fat. Just got our dinner. 
mashed potatoes up here, our side of vegetables, bell peppers and whatnot, and then delicious mule deer, mule deer backstrap. That's for dinner. Really hope you guys can join us. This is a delicious dinner. Mashed potatoes are on par. Backstrap mule deer. Mmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Delicious. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Thanks, Simone. Mm-hmm. I'm sure the mule deer. Good job, Steve. Yeah, we cooked yours together for 